Hello, hello, hello. My name is Jill Osborne. I am the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is Thursday, April 2nd, and I thought I would do a drop-in support group meeting a little bit later in the day, 4.30 California time, just to see if anybody was doing, if you had any questions, thoughts, concerns. I am here to help if I Let's see, so let's see what happens with this software, which is driving me crazy. All right, so like, really, what the hell? Okay. <laughs> Are we working? Hello, Facebook. Hi, Kate, nice to see you. I don't know if anybody's around, so I just thought I'd pop in and see if anybody Needed some help with their IC. And there's a very cool new research study that crossed my desk today that I think is absolutely fantastic that I want to talk about. All right. Again, Facebook is not showing me who is coming in. This is so frustrating. What is going on with Facebook? Hello. Sh hey, Sherry. Well, YouTube's working. Woohoo! I'll take it. <laughs> I got to move that up. Hello, Sherry. Hi, Mary. Hi, Lorraine. Hello, Elise. How are you guys doing? How is life? Hello, Iris. It's nice to see you. I know that this is an unscheduled meeting. I just thought I'd drop on. I just got back from my walk. I'm all sweaty, but that's okay. Hi, Mary. Okay, so I'm so like frustrating. Hi, Sherry again. Hello, Molly. Kate says, my IC flare is going crazy and pollen levels are high in Illinois. Anything you would recommend? Yes, this is when you want to go ahead and do your antihistamine because we know that during allergy season, uh, IC, IC is absolutely going to flare. And the question is why? And the answer is that your bladder wall has mast cells in it that get turned on by histamines. And so that's why patients flare when they have when or when it's allergy season. It's just it's just ramping up the entire allergic response, not only in your sinuses but also in your bladder and other parts of your body. So there was um, the last class on IC I took was two years ago, um, taught by Rob Muldwin, Rob Evans, and Jen Fariello, and I I did a big um, article on it, and they actually brought up. Uh, allergies and the very, very interesting flare that IC patients have, many IC patients have during allergy season or when the offshore winds are blowing. Uh, even Dr. Lil Parsons, the guy who invented Elmeron, was the one who was really one of the first to note that during allergy season, his patients often flared or during the Santa Ana winds where it was bringing a lot of pollens and a lot of stuff from the foothills down over the city. So in that class, uh, what they suggested is that you up your allergy medicine during allergy season. And of course, you got to follow the diet. You got to protect your bladder, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I mean, it's just that extra level of irritation. And I can, let me grab my handy dandy thing here. Um, hey, man, you know what? Are we all not being super casual? How many people are wearing their pajamas right now or yoga pants right now? I will show you my streaming outfit. Yes, cargo pants. One of my favorite t-shirts. Woohoo! There you go. <laughs> this is just because I went and walked. I, I'm, I'm not dressing up for these drop-in meetings, guys. You're lucky I got make a little bit of makeup on. All right. So here's a three-dimensional picture of the bladder wall. So remember the bladder wall has a nice thick coating in it uh, that covers it. This coating is a nice thick protective barrier. Underneath the coating, we've got four to five layers of urothelial cells, also known as umbrella cells, are the biggest cells in the human body. When one of these is damaged, it takes to be replaced. That's why you can't follow the diet for a week nothing happens in a week. It takes two weeks for things to heal. I can talk about that later. Underneath, yeah. Under this layer though, is we have a layer of blood vessels. You can see a blood vessel. We've got a layers of nerves and we have layers of, we've got mast cells. 
And this is where the mast cells are. They get turned on during allergy season. So Kate, you are absolutely not alone. Hi, Jean. It's nice to see you. Kate says, it seems like my urethra flares when allergy goes crazy. What would you recommend as the best antihistamine? So, um, Kate, listen, I've got a really good blog on our website over on the IC Network, icnetwork.org, that is called The Seven Causes of Urethral Pain. And you can't, let's make sure that you're not guessing in the wrong direction, okay? So when we think about urethral pain, you have to remember, number one, that your urethra and your bladder are mucous membrane organs. So they rely on a nice thick coating of mucus. They're meant to be moist. If they're not moist, if they're dry, it's gonna be more irritating. Dry mouth hurts, so does dry vulva, dry vagina, dry urethra, and dry bladder. Here, hold on a sec. And yes, this is diluted Gatorade. Okay, so we're gonna see urethral irritation in a couple of different circumstances. I was just eating trail mix too. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. I know not to mix eating and talking. Okay, so number one, chemical irritation. If I put on a pair of underwear wash and shear tied within five or 10 minutes, I will have urethral irritation because my skin is dry. So don't underestimate the role that chemicals can play. If you're using the wrong laundry detergent, fabric softener, dryer sheets, those are leaving chemicals in your, in your uh, clothing that will then uh, hit that skin and potentially cause a chemical reaction in that skin. And in fact, one of the things that, that uh, Jen Fariella talked about in that class that she taught two years ago with Dr. Muldrin and Dr. Evans, is how incredibly important it is to remove chemicals from your personal hygiene routine. So let's make sure you're not, so as an example, the, um, the laundry detergent I use is seventh generation. That's just the one, and I don't use any fabric softener or anything like that. The second thing we want to look at also is uh, mini pads. If you happen to wear mini pads every day, mini pads have a layer of chemicals in them that helps absorb fluid. And unfortunately, when that chemical gets wet, it off gases chemicals. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, like seven or eight years ago, always introduced a new menstrual pad that was supposed to be super absorbent. Holy hell, I tried it once. And it was like I had this massive chemical burn from it. And that's actually classic, classic chemical irritation. Um, in terms of bath soap, you definitely want to use a soap that is for extremely sensitive skin, very, very mild. You don't want to use Dial. You don't want to use Irish Spring or anything like that. So the soap that we recommend is a basis soap for sensitive skin. Uh, down there, that would be, uh, you know, and and in the vagina Bible, hold on a sec, where is that book? This is the book that came out before Christmas. It's a fabulous book. Oh my God, seriously. As a woman, it doesn't matter what age you are, buy this book. This is the modern day version of Our Body, Ourselves about women's health. And she's got a really good section in here on um, on soap and rinses. And, you know, she just she just says flat out, you don't need to wash inside your body, you know, even inside your vulvar lips. But you can wash along the hairline because there's a lot of oil there that can kind of get a little rancid and sticky. Uh, but you don't necessarily wash in, on your or in, in your mucous membranes or over your mucous membranes. But she also talks about rinses. You know, a lot of shower gels out there are actually really irritating. Why? Because they have a lot of extra scents and other preservatives that make it irritating. But there are some quote unquote rinses that she talks about in this book that is appropriate, right? So, and I think I, I've told the story of my, uh, uh, the, the man that I thought I would be marrying years ago, 15, 15 years ago who I flew out to Michigan to uh, be with him because he was in Michigan at the time. And the night before I was supposed to come home, he, um, he drew a bubble bath 
And he came out, I was on the couch watching TV and he goes, oh, I made a bubble bath. Come on, come on, try it. I think you'll really like it. It was with Irish Spring. Oh, holy hell, mother of God. I looked at it and I looked at him and I looked at it and it was in my brain going, oh, crap, oh, crap, oh, crap, oh, crap. And I'm looking at him. He's so proud of himself. And it's like, I didn't want a disappointment. He's like, honey, get in. You really like it. So he goes out of the bathroom. And I thought, you know what? I don't want to let him down. I really love this guy. I really thought he was my soulmate. And uh, which he wasn't because he had an affair. But but anyway, that's another story. Um, but anyway, um, I, I sat down in the Irish Spring bubble bath. Holy hell. You have no idea. I cried for 24 hours. I They dropped me off at the airport at Detroit. I literally, he thinks I'm crying because I'm, I'm leaving him. No, 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 no. I was sobbing on the plane because my vulva was so bad from the damn Irish spring. The poor guy. So don't, so that's a perfect example of why you got to be careful with chemicals down below. We want to consider estrogen atrophy. If you feel I was working with a patient, uh, I think on Monday, who struggling with a lot of urethral pain, I said, do you feel like a drop of urine stuck in your urethra? She goes, yeah. I said, well, that's usually estrogen atrophy. She goes, oh, yeah, the doctor did give me some estrogen cream, but you know, I did, didn't use it. It's like, why? She goes, because it didn't help me right away. And it's like, yeah, but that doesn't the way estrogen cream works. Our goal here is to give your body what it needs to produce mucus and it needs estrogen. And so if you use a little bit of estrogen cream at the entrance to your urethra, then there is a chance that, that your, your urethral cells will be able to use that estrogen to produce more moisture. Um, another really interesting thing about the urethra is that there is a gland that wraps around it. So, you know, the male urethra is very long five, six inches, wherever. The female urethra, urethra is about the size of your little finger, right? Um, and about halfway up your little finger, on the outside of the, of the tube, on the outside of the tube, is a gland called the periurethral gland. Now, the periurethral gland is, in fact, the female prostate gland. We have a prostate, ladies. Who knew? <laughs> and in fact... The very, very first article I put on the IC network in 1994 when I built it was an article from the youth from UCLA about female urethral syndrome. And, and it was something like the female prostate gland. And just like the male prostate gland is somewhat notorious for becoming infected and stagnant, uh, so is the female prostate gland, the periurethral gland. Um, the drainage ducts are tiny and they're very, very easily blocked. So what happens is some people actually get an infection in this gland. Um, and it's imagine a deep pimple. That's what it feels like. So, um, uh, uh, it's very easy to figure out if you have an infection in your periurethral gland, because you basically wash your hands really well use a little bit of lubricant, and then stick your finger up your vagina about an inch and rub the front side because your urethra is in front of your vagina. So you just rub the front side. And if you feel a little painful bump like a pea, a green pea, or a, a little painful lump, then the odds are you have an infected periurethral gland. And I've worked with many patients who've had them. And research studies are fascinating because the research studies have shown that 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 gland can be infected by a lot of different bacteria and a lot of different bacterial biofilms. So generally the way they treat that because they're they're biofilm infections so they tend to be pretty resistant to antibiotic therapy what they do is what they do with men they do they try to drain drain it and the way they drain it is you're laying on your back they stick a dilator or something into your urethra and then the doctor has his finger this up your JJ and then he pushes <laughs> and he's trying to squeeze and express the fluid in that, um, you know, in, in that gland, that infected gland. Not the funnest thing in the world to go through, my friends. 
not the funnest thing in the world to go through, but it is very, very doable. So I think I, I think over 25 years, I probably worked with, I don't know, maybe two patients a year who have had infected glands, periurethral glands. Um, so go on over, over to our website, icnetwork.org, search for, uh, search for a blog called The Seven Causes of Urethral Pain, or just search for urethral pain, and you'll find it. And you can look at some of the other things. Of course, we cannot underestimate also something called the, the urethral diaphragm muscles. The urethral diaphragm muscles are right down along the base of your, the, the, your, your urethra, the bottom of your urethra. And guess what? If your urethral diaphragm muscles are tight, guess what happens? Frequency, urgency, pain. And so if you, when you try to pee, you can't, you cannot let your urine out right away, then that tells us that your muscles are probably very, very tight and we have to work on that. Hello, Christine. Um, so, um, uh, what would you recommend as the best antihistamines to take? Uh, hydroxazine, Atarax or Vistril, preferably Vistril, is considered the best antihistamine used by IC patients in research studies. It's the most common one. It's mentioned in the American Urology Association guidelines as a therapy for IC. Uh, it's a step two treatment option. I took it for 10 years so, uh, and I found that medication particularly helpful. One of the things I like about hydroxyzine, it has a very nice beneficial side effect. It has an anti-anxiety effect. And you know, I'm sorry. Hey man, especially now in 2020 with this freaking virus, seriously, raise your hand if you got anxiety. I've got anxiety. I was just walking and I had my mask on and you know, you're like looking at people walking towards you. So you cross the street and you pray they don't cross the street. And then up behind comes a runner, like three feet away from you puffing and you're going, oh my God, can I walk in peace, please? Can I just walk in peace and not have anybody breathe on me? I'm going to stay on my little court. I'm not going to go down into the neighborhood, I don't think, anymore. It's just oh, stress level. So anyway, hydroxyzine has a nice antihistaminic effect. I mean, um, anti-anxiety effect. Kate says, comfort is key. Terry says, are there allergy meds better for IC patients to use than others? Again, I think the hydroxyzine is really the best one. Um, however, in the class uh, on IC where they talked about it, they also mentioned Montelukast for patients who struggle with asthma. Um, they suggested that patients who have worsening asthma during, uh, during um, allergy season consider adding Montelukast. And... Um, let me see if I can find it here. Hold on a sec. Hold on. I just totally moved all my magazines. It's not that one. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. So this was my summer... 2018 IC magazine. And generally we do a really exhaustive summary of the classes that are taught on IC at the American Urology Association. And um, um, yeah, this is it for sure, 100%. So if you're a member of the IC network, you can just go right into onto your member page and download this, it's free. Okay, so let me just go to the section on allergies. I gotta find it, baby. During allergy season, they suggest increasing the dosage of hydroxyzine and or using Montelukast, especially in patients with a history of asthma. Okay, so that's straight from Robert Evans, Robert Moldwin to the top doctors in the United States. Uh, Molly says, I've been waiting for delivery for 5.5 hours. I've called the pharmacy. They're trying to find out what went wrong. Meanwhile, I'm having anxiety attacks. Lots of deep breathing, honey. Come on, lots of deep breathing. Remember, 
that a lot of anxiety is driven by catastrophizing, you know, that it's, it, you know, it's like, you can't turn your brain off. And I'm speaking as somebody who has uh, I, I, a well-known anxiety sufferer, and I took a fantastic class that changed my life. But that said, one of the things that drives anxiety is catastrophizing. You know, it's just like every thought going through your brain is negative. Oh, will I get my groceries? Will somebody have touched it? Do I've got to wash them? What if I get this? What if I give it to somebody? What if my neighbor gets it? What if a family member gets it? What if, well, you know, you know, you get these rolling, rolling negative thoughts. But here's the problem is every time you have a negative thought, you get a, a jolt of adrenaline. Now, the adrenaline is what drives the fight or flight response. So in normal life, in normal life, if we go back 5,000 years ago, you know, you had adrenaline when a saber-toothed tiger was charging you, you know, or something was scary, maybe once a day. And the purpose of adrenaline is to mobilize your body so that you can run. You can fight or run, fight or flight. Um, unfortunately, in modern society, we have a ton of stressors. We have way more stressors we, the, now than our ancestors did. And so the, um, the problem with that is that we get a lot of adrenaline. You watch TV, adrenaline, adrenaline, scary thought, scary thought, scary thought. You talk to a friend, scary thought. And before you know it, it's like everything going through your brain is, is frightening. And you get jolts of adrenaline every single time. So what the class taught me, Molly, is the secret to controlling anxiety is to control adrenaline. That when you learn how to control the adrenaline, the anxiety slowly drops. And I am living proof that it does because I have not had a panic attack since I took this class 20 years ago. So how do you do that? Whenever you have a negative thought, what, my, what the phobies class taught me is number one, visualize a stop sign. Just close your, just close your eyes and Visualize a big red stop sign. Just stop your brain for a moment. Just stop. I just tell your brain, stop. Don't want to think about that. Stop. Then after you visualize the stop sign, take one single slow, deep breath in for three, out for three. So let's do it in and out. Okay. That oxygen now in your bloodstream turns off that adrenaline. It renders it chemically neutral. Now, the third step after you do that is you've got to remind yourself it's a thought. It has no power. So what I say to myself is, oh, my God, Jill, you're not God. You can't predict that. You can't predict the future. You know, I just try to remind myself that it's a thought. It has no power. And, and, um, so they sent us home with this three step stop sign, deep breath, minimize the thought. And the first day they said, all right, now every single time you have a negative thought, do the deep breath, do the stop sign in the deep breath. Cause our goal here is just get the, all the adrenaline out of your bloodstream. And Molly, you need to do this, my friend. And they warned us. They said, you're going to do this hundreds of times. You have no freaking clue how often your brain is negative. And they were right. I went home and I was in the car. I was walking out to the freaking car from this class thinking negative thoughts. And so I started doing that. And I probably did it 100 or 200 times the first day. The next day, I did it half as much, maybe 50 times. The day after that, I did another half as much, maybe 25 times. By the end of the week, what do you think happened? My anxiety was gone because I'd gotten rid of the adrenaline. It's the adrenaline that drives a racing heartbeat and, and difficulty breathing and the panic and the anxiety and all that sort of stuff. Um, and when you render the adrenaline neutral, a lot of the anxiety goes away. And so Molly, that's what I want you to do. What I, I think you should do is stop sign, deep breath, minimize the thought. And remember, we're not God, we can't predict the future follow right back into your faith or whatever it is that gives you comfort comfort. I have a video on our website called anxiety and I see where I go over that more in depth, but I think that that would, that's something we all have to do. I was catching myself being extremely anxious a couple of days ago. I was just anxious walking. No, I was because a freaking runner ran right in front of me breathing, but I luckily had my mask on. It wasn't the perfect mask. It was a cotton mask. And I'm just going, son of a bitch. Urgh. Then I walk up the hill to my house. 
And I'm thinking, I'm home free. Take off the freaking mask. Get over the hill. People walking right in front of my house. Had to put it back on. Cross the street. Anyway. But, you know, find the humor in it, too. All right. Hello, Ruth. Hello, Sandy. Hi, Virginia. Kay says, I need to read that book. All this information is so helpful. Yeah, like literally the two books you've got to have is Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain and The Vagina Bible. Those are the books. Now, okay, so I got to tell you something really, really interesting here. Um, a new article crossed my desk in a, in a research thing. So here, hold on a sec. Let me find it. Uh, ooh, the, I, I just got my monarch butterfly report. The monarch butterflies are migrating. Yes. Here, hold on. I got to find it. All right. I don't need that. Where is it? Was it from the FDA? Is that it? No, it wasn't from the FDA. I didn't delete it. I know I save it. It wasn't from Newswise. Come on. Is it from that one? Oh, come on. I saved it on my other computer. Here, hold on. I sit in front of two computers here. So, and if I disappear suddenly, it's a computer I'm streaming on right now has a conflict with a driver and every now and then it just craps out. Oh, okay. Her, hold on. I got to find this. Where is this? It was so cool. Okay. Can I send it to Dr. Weiss? So I can just go to my sent email. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I can just go to my sent email on this computer. Okay. So let me come back to this computer. There it is. Ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. 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 So now y'all remember that. Where is it? Where is it? All right. Okay. Now, now y'all know, y'all know, I have been talking about this book for a couple of months now. And one of the things that Dr. Weiss talks about, so remember, we have our subtypes. Not everybody has bladder disease. Quite a few people, a lot of people have muscle issues. We, we know that for sure. Here, let me fix this. So I'm looking forward. All right. So we know that there are muscle issues that drive bladder symptoms. We know that. We know if your urethral diaphragm muscles are tight, you're going to have frequency urgency. We know if your levator muscles are tight, you're probably going to have frequency urgency, right? But, so, but remember, the problem with Western medicine is that it's very compartmentalized. Specialists stay in their box. Urologists stay in their box. Uh, the urinary tract gynecologists stay in their box, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so here we've got Dr. Weiss who is a myofascial pain specialist. And what he's saying in the pelvis is you cannot consider the bladder in isolation in IC patients because there are too many other factors that influence the bladder, like the muscles and the nerves, right? And when we know, we know that if your bladder is screaming in pain, your muscles are gonna get tight. We know that. We also know that if your muscles are tight, your bladder's not going to get the circulation and the nutrition and the oxygen it needs to be healthy, and the bladder wall's going to break down. We know that, right? So, but the question is, is this new information or old information? Okay, this is mind-blowing. This is mind-blowing. So here, I got I to move this right here. So this came out in... Um, one of the urology journals today. And the title is Bladder Pain Syndrome I See Due to Pedendal Nerve Compression Described in 1915. A reminder for treating pelvic pain a century later. Okay. So here is a doctor during World War I who sees a very clear connection 
between nerves and muscles and bladder symptoms. So I want to read this to you. This is fascinating. I got to buy the whole journal article, but this is the abstract. So here it is. I see or bladder pain syndrome is highly painful and disabling and probably the most misdiagnosed urologic condition. It's classic symptoms of perineal pain, urinary urgency and frequency despite sterile urine cultures were already described more than a century ago in a report on soldiers during World War I due to chronic pudendal nerve compression. This article translates a report from 1915 on pudendal neuropathy and discusses its author, George Zulzer, who, who died in 1949. Um, and it was an article in German. In his article entitled Irritation of the Pudendal Nerve, a frequent clinical picture during war feigning bladder catarrh, which means having, uh, uh, oh, what's the right word for catarrh? Okay, I'll look it up. Zolzer describes his observation of soldiers during World War I presenting with a triad of perineal pain, urinary urgency, and frequency despite sterile urine cultures excluding infections. He also documented a characteristic skin hypersensibility of the perineum in a rhomboid shape, which corresponds to the innervation of the pudendal nerve with its two branches derived from the, from the pudendal plexus. He regards the symptomology as rare during peace, but as a disease of trench warfare, which can be easily diagnosed with clear urine and a painful skin island overlying the pudendal nerve. How does it uh, tested by a simple needle exam? Zolzer, born in Germany, was forced to emigrate to the United States in 1934, was also an important pioneer in diabetes research using the pan pancreas extracts. In this historical description dating from a hundred years ago, George probably gave the first exact clinical description of symptoms due to pudendal nerve compression. Pudendal nerve compression should always be taken into account when examining and treating patients with ICBPS. And of course, now, why, are, why, why is the nerve compressed? Because the muscles are tight, right? So again, in this book, what's interesting is Dr. Weiss did exactly that. He believed that a lot more people, a lot more IC patients had nerve injury than they realized. So how, how did he find it? He found it by studying skin sensitivity. And if, he, if the skin was sensitive or the subcutaneous tissue under the skin was sensitive, Think about having a scar tissue. For those of you who have had uh, an abdominal hysterectomy or you've had a C-section, and you know when you work around the scar, the tissue underneath the scar, the subcutaneous area, can be quite irritating. And that also is a sign of nerve sensitivity. And so it is so incredibly cool that here we've got this book just released, which is a master class in, in pelvic anatomy and I see and the bladder and the influences that will cause I see symptoms. And by golly, he matches exactly this report from World War I. Isn't that freaking amazing? Now the question, of course, one of the questions, of course, is, I think that I think so interesting is why do we have perineal pain? You know, whether you have vulvodynia or IC, you know that section of skin between your rectum and your vagina or your rectum and your prostate? <coughs> the perineum is like the pain hotspot, right? If, if anything's going to start screaming, it's going to be the perineum. And one of the things he talks about in this book is that the perineum is actually, there's something called the perineal body right underneath the skin, which is an attachment point for four or five muscles. So if the perineum is painful, that's probably because you've got a muscle that's pulling on the perineal body. Fascinating. <coughs> Fascinating. And that's just allergies, guys. It's just allergies. You don't have to worry. So who knew? Oh, let's see. So here's a picture of the perineal body. Um, 
Uh, there are the little tiny knob right there. That's a perineal body. And then a man, they have the exact same knob right there, right? So why is the perineum a hot spot of pain? Again, because of muscle. Let me drink some water. All right. Let me check in with YouTube down here. Becky says, I really like Honest Beauty Eczema Body Wash. Never heard of it. Hi, Ferdinand. Ferdinand says, I've had IC since 2000. I'm a 62-year male. When can we expect a medicine? Also, my urine tur is, turns a dark color. All my CBCs, FBC, and creatinine, all normal. I'm presently in the Philippines, but I'm from New Jersey. So, uh, so Ferdinand, it begins with your subtype. You know, we can't really have a good discussion about therapies until we really understand what variation of IC you have. Do you have a bladder wall injury from chemotherapy or from ketamine or from a terrible diet? Or do you have a muscle injury uh, from falling, being a bike rider, being an athlete, anything at all like that? Um, and they're treated very, very differently. I will tell you that 95% of the guys that I work with, when we spend time, when we go back in time, we usually find significant recurring pelvic floor trauma. And it's that muscle trauma and nerve trauma that then causes the bladder wall to break down and to give you the bladder symptoms. What makes you unique though, is your urine is a dark color. That's what you got to figure out. It sounds like normally that happens. If your urine gets dark, dark yellow or brown, then you're dehydrated. You're not, you're not hydrated. Your urine is too strong, but there might be other reasons why your urine is dark also. Um, and that, if that continues, even if, even if you're drinking plenty of water, you've got to talk to your doctor and make sure they rule out any other thing that could be causing that. Elise says, stress worsens my IC. I've had terrible pain in the last two weeks. I can feel that my pelvic floor muscles are super tight, so I'm trying to find ways to relax them. Heating pad, my dear. This is, uh, this is I rotate with a couple of different heating pads, but this is um, our, um, the heating pad that we sell on the IC Network website. I've got three of these. Um, and it's just the perfect shape to fit right over your belly. I use mine more on the backside. I, I lay it on the bed like this. And then I make sure that the hot part is under my left piriformis muscles, which is where my dominant problem is. Yeah. Iris says, just found out she had a pudendal nerve issue going on too. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's exciting. It's super, super exciting because now we understand why patients weren't responding to therapy. I mean, seriously, go back 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Every IC patient was given Elmeron. Every IC patient, and guess what? 70% or more never responded well to the Elmeron. Why? Because their problems were not with their bladder. We now know that there are lots of other things going on here. I mean, we do, we do. All right, let's go back to Facebook. Yvonne says, Jill, do you know why when I'm having pain and voiding that I have a strong ammonia smell to me or urine? I have noticed this goes hand in hand. I've had a naturopathic doctor say I have nitri nitrites in my urine. Well, honey, anytime you have nitrites in your urine, that means you have bacteria in your urine. And that nitrites are usually only a byproduct of pathogenic bacteria. So if you do a uh, urine dipstick and you've got a double positive, positive leukocytes, positive nitrites, girl, you got real infection and that needs to be identified and corrected. Um, uh, important to know too, though, that as we get older, our pH changes um, when you're menopausal, all sorts of other things happen. And yes, you can become a bit more pungent. Is that the right way to say it? Pungent? But it might not necessarily be anything to worry about. But the ammonia smell is a whole nother story. That's a pretty strong smell. So I think that you need to talk to your doctor about that. Hello, Cheryl. Liz says, have you heard of the cream called Jolva? Like instead of vulva, it's a J. Boy, wouldn't that be, oh my God, that would be a hysterical gaming name. Hi, I'm Jolva, I'm a hunter. <laughs> Can I join your raid? You can call me Jolpa for short. 
Let's see. Let me look it up. I have funny gaming names, so when I play games. Jolva, a cream for our delicate feminine parts. Let's see. It's a natural cosmetic cream. Hmm. Okay, stop it with the sign up button. It's all natural anti aging cosmetic cream for your delicate feminine parts. Created by a triple board certified OBGYN. Moisturizing, repairing, rejuvenating. Well, what the heck's in it? Ingredients. Well, it. Uh, oh, okay. So it's um, <laughs> coconut oil with a botanical base, vitamin E, shea butter, emu oil, water, glycerin, a little bit of alcohol for antimicrobial effect, and alpine rose stem cells. Uh, and you just apply it to your vulva clitoris. So that's really not that different from... V Magic. So V Magic is also an over-the-counter product that is used for women who struggle with dryness. And in V Magic, you've got extra virgin olive oil, avocado fruit oil, honey, uh, beeswax, um, and sea buckthorn oil. So I mean, but honestly, if you're dry, you can just go get a tub of coconut oil, and it works quite well. Elise says, I use a heating pad. Don't know what I would have done without it, but I wish I had one like the one you just told up. Elise, you can get it in our store. I think it's like, I mean, listen, it's, it'll last for 10 years. It's so, it's so durable. I have, again, I have three of them. I've had them forever. We've sold he heating pads forever. They're made by uh, a small business here in uh, California for me. Um, and they're all lavender now. They're not brown anymore. That tells you that that's an old one. Uh, they're lavender. Sometimes they're turquoise, but most of the time they're lavender. Um, just know that it's heavy. And it, and so, well, let me just, let's see how much it is. Hold on a sec. They're not, they're not cheap. I think I pay like $20, $20 for each one. I think like 20 or something somewhere in there. Yeah, so it's $29. It's $29. So I'm pretty sure my wholesale price for it is $20. I always try to keep the prices down as low as I possibly can. I try because we're all patients and we're doing this together, right? Christine says, I take Allegra, it's hydroxyzine better. I mean, it's just about finding what works for you. If you're doing fine with the Allegra, go for it. If you're not where you'd like to be, then go ahead and try the hydroxyzine too. Okay, please tell me never to eat while I'm streaming. Never, ever, ever, ever. I should never eat when I'm streaming, even a freaking reason like I just did. Okay, stop it, Jill. Uh, Laka Laka says, was diagnosed three months ago with moderate IC. You had a car accident in December 2019. I had a lot of caustic pain after the accident and thought that with time it would be, have, could this be the trigger for your IC? Absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind it is the trigger for your IC. So the question is, what is the de your definition of IC? And the answer is, you know, there's a huge population of IC patients whose symptoms begin began after trauma. Could be a tailbone trauma, falling, uh, you know, falling on your tailbone, being in a car accident, et cetera, et cetera. When those coccyx muscles uh, 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 and the levator muscles by the coccyx get messed up, guess what? Your bladder gets messed up. And you seriously, seriously, you got to get this book. It explains it all. And it has great case, patients, uh, case studies in here and success stories. Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain by Dr. Jerome Weiss. This will explain exactly why you have bladder symptoms after your car accident 
and it will tell you what to do about it because you could do bladder therapies for years and not and not get better because your fundamental problem really is not your bladder your fundamental problem is the, the fact that you sustained an injury around your tailbone that messed up your levator ani muscles and that's what's messing your bladder up so you need to have a proper pelvic floor examination get an idea what the hell's going on with your muscles etc cetera, etc cetera. now i tell you let me tell you a story and I, and this is a case study that i had in one of our magazines last year you know, um, I was working with, a. I don't want to get this right because there's always so many stories going through my brain here. Um, a, a lady who'd been dealing with big time bladder symptoms for years, just absolute years, right? And um, nothing was getting better. She tried tons and tons of therapies. None of the therapies were fixing her. None of the bladder therapies were fixing her. And then she watched one of my lectures and I introduced the concept of pudendal neuralgia and pelvic floor. And so she did, her, she did some research and she was looking at the symptoms of pudendal neuralgia and she thought, you know what, that's me. I think that's me. She took that to her doctor and the doctor said, yeah, that could be you. So the doctor sent her to a pelvic floor physical therapist and the pelvic floor physical therapist went, wow, your muscles are really messed up, but do you know your tailbone is, is crooked? Your tailbone is not in the proper position and does not have the proper arch to it. And that is because her tailbone had been broken and had healed incorrectly. Um, or there, you know, I mean, it was just completely out of position. So then I don't, I, I don't remember correctly. You could go back into our magazine and you could find those, uh, whether they did an MRI or whatever, they clearly saw that her tailbone was either crooked to the left, crooked to the right, or was straight instead of curved. Because your tailbone is supposed to be kind of slightly curved, right? Like a little bit curved. Hers was straight and crooked. So we knew her tailbone was screwed up. And so what happened then is she actually went to a chiropractor and said, is there any way you can help me with this weird tailbone that's not in the right position? And she start and and I'm 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 very wary of chiropractic. I'm working with another patient who has a terrible spinal injury from chiropractic done wrong. Okay, but that said, in this patient's case, they were working in the tailbone area, and it took about nine months. But what do you think happened? They got her tailbone corrected, and her symptoms went away, compl almost completely, and she had a baby, and she's quite happy now. So she went from being completely non-functional and terrible pain to having a baby, being really happy with her life, very, very few flares. And when she has a flare, she knows it's related to her muscles and her bones down there. She goes right back to chiropractic to fix that bony structure. So laka laka, I think that that's something that you've got to be aware of. With your car accident, did you suffer any breaks, any major trauma? Do we have scar tissue down there? Anything at all like that? You have muscles tied on one side that could be pulling your pit, your tailbone out of position. That's absolutely possible. Okay, absolutely possible. And so again, breaking through chronic pelvic pain by Dr. Jerome Wise must be your required reading. And I want you to read it and I want you to ponder your injuries. The first four, four chapters are all understanding anatomy. It's a master class in pelvic anatomy. And so as you're reading this, I want you to always be thinking about your injury from that accident. Because he talks, he also talks about a car accident. One of the case studies in the in this book was a, a I, I think it was like um a um a friend in collision where the legs of the, of the driver or whoever, whoever the case study was, they were hit suddenly and the pressure of the legs pushed directly back into the pelvis and messed the pelvis up. And, um, and so there were definitely consequences to that, to that accident and that, but they were able to eventually figure it out and get it addressed. And okay. So I hope that makes sense. I hope that that makes sense. Joan says, I take Zyrtec and hydroxyzine. Okay, what was the antihistamine that was just banned by the FDA?
Also, Monty Lucast, which we talked about for allergies and asthma, also had an FDA alert about causing some serious mental health. They just pulled. Like yesterday, they just pulled an allergy one off of the uh, market. Let me see if I can find it. What was it? What was it? Oh, well. Zantac. Oh, no, that was, it was not allergy medicine, heart, heart medicine. You said Zyrtec and that triggered triggered that in me. It was Zantac. It's not an allergy medicine. It's uh, for your stomach. That has been pulled from the market. Kristen says, my son used to take Monte Lucasti as asthma and so do I, but mine is mild. So, um, Kristen, if he's still taking monolucast, make sure you look up the FDA warning about that because what they found is that it appeared to trigger some mental health issues. And so for patients who are already struggling with any me mental health issues, it just exacerbated it. Gina says, you are, you are a breath of fresh air, air during this unsettling time. Dr. Evans is my doc. Glad to hear about the allergy asthma med from him. Amanda says, well, I'm sure everyone has the same question, but I can only use seventh generation toilet paper due to symptoms. Of course, can't find it anywhere. Any suggestions? Yeah, you know what? Honestly, I use um, I use bamboo toilet paper now. Uh, here, I'll get you the name of it. Um, I, I used to use Costco, but what happened is regular paper, the, especially the cheap, cheap paper, you notice when you pull the toilet roll, all this dust comes off. Um, and, um, I was having some skin issues last year and that was one of the things my doctor, my OBGYN told me to do was to stop using regular paper toilet paper and to try bamboo, uh, toilet paper. And so let me, um, I just, and I got, I, I get it from Amazon and also like our local Whole Foods. Uh, let me see if I can give you the brand name for that. Amazon is getting rich off of this. Let me tell you, I don't know about you guys. I have ordered so much. Oh, Cabo. Cabo Tree Pre Bamboo Toilet Paper, which is a septic safe, biodegradable bath tissue. And what's interesting, there's no dust. The dust doesn't come off of it. I really, really like it. So Cabo, C-A-B-O-O. -O. But there are other brands that do. It's just a, it's just a bamboo rather than a paper toilet paper. Hi, Denise. Nancy says, are you not concerned about hydroxyzine anticholinergic effect causing dementia? Uh, yes, we would be, especially in cumulative patients. However, the last study that came out about it last year uh, actually found that the antihistamines were not apparently the cause of the cognitive decline or dementia, that they that they backed off on the warnings about the antihistamines, but they kept the warnings up for the for the low dose antidepressants, et cetera, et cetera. So Nancy, if you go back on our website, I'm gonna say like six months ago, that was like six months ago where we, and I can dig to find it if you want, just not right now, but it was another study, I believe from England, where they found, where they were assessing the role of anticholinergic medications in its contribution to cognitive decline and dementia and Alzheimer's might have been three months ago. And in that study, the, the antihistamines were not linked to the same degree that the antidepressants were. And also the ditropans, the detrols, the anticholinergic um, uh, bladder spasm medication are also strongly linked to cognitive decline and dementia. And I think if I remember correctly, that if you used it every day for three years at a certain dosage, there was like a 50% increase in the risk of dementia. And so this is why they are now cutting way back on these medications. Um, and you're, you always want to ask your doctor for something other than that. So as an example, 
rather than doing ditropan or detrol for bladder spasms, uh, you would instead do Mirbatrix, or also known as Mirabigron, which does the, accomplishes the same antispasmodic effect, but it's not an anticholinergic and it's not risk of cognitive decline. That said, unfortunately, it's much more expensive. And I was talking to Robert Evans, Dr. Evans about this. We actually exchanged email about this last fall. And he said, it's a, it's a real tragedy that we know that these anticholinergic medications can absolutely change somebody's brain. And yet the insurance companies won't cover the safer medic medicine, that the insurance companies are forcing doctors to prescribe the more dangerous medication, which is amazing. Yeah, something he was really quite upset about. Hello, Diane. You guys, I'm obviously about 20 minutes behind reading your stuff. So, hi, Karen. Another thing about hydroxyzine though, is it, it changes, it can change your dreams. It's, we call them hydroxyzine dreams, uh, where if you're having a happy dream, it becomes a joyful dream. If you're having a good sex dream, it becomes the best sex of your life dream. Like with me, we have three movie stars. <laughs> that's, that's true, that's true. Hydroxyzine really gives you fantastic dreams. And you know, we are occasionally do have sexual dreams and I did, and it was three cowboy movie stars. <laughs> it's true, it was Kevin Costner. It was somebody else and somebody else. Thank you, hydroxyzine. I still remember that dream like 20 years later. Okay, but if you have a nightmare, it becomes a night terror. And that's why I stopped it, is it finally started giving me nightmares. And they were really, really violent, aggressive nightmares, like watching my family be stabbed in front of me. And I was just like, I'm done. And we literally within 24 hours of stopping the medication, the, the nightmares went away. Robin says lemon balm has been helping her. Awesome. Lemon balm is a mint. It is not citrus lemon. It is a mint with a lemony scent, which is known for being somewhat calming and soothing to nerves. And so that lemon balm's helping you, I think is great. Lemon balm is also in a product called Sisto Renew. You can grow lemon balm. I've got lemon balm out in my garage. And I'm drinking very dilute Gatorade, guys, even though it's on the bad list. Remember, my bladder's pretty good. I can do this where some of you can't because I did a really long walk and I got a little dehydrated. So I have to drink it. Bladder says, I've been in a bladder flare for two weeks. My Botox was canceled. I'm so depressed over it. So um, I was reading an article yesterday, last night, uh, published um, in one of the journals or one of the urologist newsletters, and they were talking specifically about how COVID is affecting your uh, urology clinics. And basically, the rule of thumb for urology clinics is you're only going to treat cancer. You're only they're only treating cancer, life threatening events maybe infection and or severe pain. Pretty much every other procedure is being canceled or cut way back. Um, uh, they predicted that only the large clinics were probably gonna be able to stay open, that many of the smaller uro uh, urology clinics are closing and they're laying staff off. It's a rare urology clinic that can't afford to pay employees for a long period of time or they're cutting back to just a, a certain essential few. Um, some clinics are locking their door and you have to knock on the door to be let in. They don't want people to congregate. Um, and of course, we also know that urologists are now being conscripted to provide help uh, in areas where COVID is terrible and they've got hundreds and hundreds of patients who are uh, struggling to breathe. And so you should not be surprised if your, your, your urology clinics are canceled. Um, if you used to go to the urology clinic to have a rescue installation, you, what you could do is ask if they will uh, teach you how to do a home installation so that you can do it from home. 
but you can pretty much expect that hydrodistension, cystoscopies, some of those basic diagnostic tests are probably going to be canceled unless they feel unless they're really really worried about cancer or you've got blood in your urine or a severe infection um we've all just got to hang tight we got to hang tight they're trying to save their lives and they're trying to save your life because they don't want you to come into a clinic where another patient could have been infected they're trying to save their staff i mean it's a it's a real dire situation right now Sherry says, your daughter is in Qatar on deployment. Would you please thank her for her service from us, Sherry? I would love for you to tell her that the IC community is so grateful for her service. Gladys says, I'm going to try a video call with my urogynecologist and see what he can do for me. So we would hope, we would hope that this would be a time when a doctor might lighten up a little bit on, on restricting the use of opiate medication in patients who are in severe pain. If they cannot see you, if they cannot give you your rescue installation, I think it's perfectly reasonable for you to say, well, what can you do me? Can you for the short term, perhaps give me some Norco to help with this pain? That's not unreasonable. I, I don't think that that's unreasonable. I don't know what they would say. Hello, Sarah from Australia. Uh, Marjan says that would include vulvodynia, the pudendal nerves. Absolutely, 100%, 100%. And it happened to me last year. I had I had really bad vulvodynia in my 20s for several, year, for several years to the point that I couldn't wear jeans, right? I mean, I my, doc, my doctor kept saying, do you have the most sensitive vulva I've ever seen? And it's like, well, yeah, it feels like I've got a yeast infection. It feels like somebody's rubbed sandpaper across your vulva. It hurts so bad. But when you go to the doctor, they go, well, you look fine. And it's like, well, hell, I might look fine, but it hurts like hell right now. I cannot wear underwear, right? And it's so, it's so ironic in hindsight to now go back and go, okay, I was in my 20s. I was a mega athlete at the time. Clearly, my vulvodynia back then was from a muscle issue and a nerve issue. I have no doubt about it. But Marjan, it happened again last year, uh, exactly a year ago, where I felt like this pin pricking sensation along my hairline down there. And over a period of a week, it started in the front, went all the way in the back. And I got really bad. I go to urgent care. I mean, I go to the urgent OBGYN and he goes, well, I think you've got yeast. They put me on yeast stuff for six weeks. Nothing worked. Go back to my doctor, my regular OBGYN. She goes, I think it's eczema. I'm giving you a steroids. I did steroids for two months. That didn't work. I was walking around wearing, you watch the videos back then. I'm wearing long dresses with no underwear because my I got pinpricks down there. And I finally got referred to um, one of Kaiser's best pelvic pelvic pain specialists. I did a phone consult with her and she goes, so Jill, I'm like, yeah. She goes, so you're a pelvic floor patient, right? And I'm like, yeah. So when have you last been to physical therapy? It's like about two years ago. She goes, you need to go back to physical therapy. You actually have pudendal neuralgia. This is caused by your, your muscles. She says, I have no doubt about it. I have no doubt about it. You are, your vulvodynia is being triggered by tight muscles triggering that nerve. So she sent me back to uh, physical therapy. And what did they find? Very, very tight muscles on both sides again. And that's when I really got serious about using my last wand after that, because I had never associated a pinpricking sensation on both sides of my vulva with a tight nerve, but that should have been a real clue. Should have been a giant, giant clue to me. Um, and then they also gave me a little topical lidocaine uh, estrogen jelly to use to calm the nerves down since they'd already been so aggravated. And it's gone. It fixed it. But it took about two, three months of physical therapy combined with the lidocaine to turn completely turn off that vulvodynia. And so it's so ironic you go back in time and you think about, I mean, seriously, we should have stock in cranberry companies because how many of us drank gallons and gallons and gallons of cranberry stuff and also in monostat because how many of us have bought dozens and dozens and dozens of monostat over the years for our quote vulvodynia ic 
only to discover afterwards that for a lot of us, it's all muscle and nerve and nothing to do with our bladder wall and nothing to do with our vulvar skin. <laughs> Lauren says the peri cul-de-sac is in fall. I know uh, you're... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's your spell checker run amok. <laughs> I don't know what you were trying to write there. That's funny. The Perry cul-de-sac. <laughs> Sherry says, how long have you had this cough? I have had this cough maybe in the last 10 minutes or the last 15 minutes. Cause I, I just did a long walk. It's not a problem, Sherry. I do not. This is not a chest cough. It's scary though, right? Like it's so, so tragic that allergy season is in the middle of this. And so, you know, we've got our regular allergies going on. I just took a long, long walk. So of course I'm going to cough a little bit afterwards. Lauren says, I put dental nerve damage on both branches, 80% on the right side, 40% on the left side. You got a nerve block on the right side and it helped, but only lasted for three to four weeks. I'm scared to commit to the removal of pudendal nerve. Well, and, and so, I mean, Lauren, to me, I think what's more important than that is, is what damaged the nerve? Was, it, was the nerve damaged from a fall or is the nerve being damaged because of tight muscles? And if that's the case, you got to be doing your pelvic floor work too. Laka Laka says, thank you a million. We'll definitely read. I love your, I love your screen name. Laka Laka. See, doesn't that sound happy? It's like, Laka Laka. My Hawaiian name is Kila. Kila. Sharon says, the doctor's treating me for IC, doing catheter meds, 12 treatments, stop the burning after six treatments, but still have pressure and urinating a lot. Well, keep it up, hun. Keep it up. But remember, you are an anatomical mystery to be solved. It's your job to try to figure out what subtype you are. Are you bladder wall versus pelvic floor, et cetera? So make sure you come on over to our website, icnetwork.org. And um, uh, go to the page on subtype so that you can understand the, the, different, the different forms of quote unquote IC. You know, a one treatment fits all doesn't work for everybody. One treatment fits all approach that we're all very, very unique and different. For me, my ICs uh, manifested by tight muscles on my left side associated with my piriformis muscle, associated with my SI joint and the fact that I have scoliosis. Anne says, sitting a lot for work now that I'm home, using my cushion and forcing myself to get up. My bladder was overextended with the birth of my son. I couldn't feel the need to pee. Yeah, girl, you and Billy, I hear that all the time. Hello, Susan. Hi, Colleen. Lynn says, I've recently recovered from coronavirus and it really bothered your bladder. Ooh, now see, that's something we don't know yet. I mean, we, we don't know. It, I, you would be the first IC patient that I've talked with who's recovered from coronavirus. And it would be really useful if you could write up your symptoms and what happened with that. Because I would love to pass it along to the top IC doctors and see and to let them know that this is happening and maybe we can develop some data. I mean, we certainly know that viral infections can affect the bladder, but we don't have, now I will just say this, that I was looking at the research studies to uh, um, about two, three weeks ago where they were trying to see where, where you could be exposed, right? Was it in mucous membranes? Is it in, in your bowel movements and, and or is it in your urine? And the last study that I read showed they did not find any coronavirus in urine, but they did find it in bowel movements.
Anne says, after having the virus and coughing a lot, the steroid made your bladder leak. Actually, it was probably the coughing a lot that made your bladder leak because it's the coughing that messes with your pelvic floor, right? See, that's another really good thing that we, um, you know what, I got to write this down. Because uh, I want to, I'm going to send an email to all those top doctors because I'm really worried about them. Guys, seriously, I'm really, we've got a handful of IC specialists in the United States, you know, like five. And please, God, may we not lose any of these, any of these wonderful uh, men to uh, this virus. Oh, God, I hope not. So um, let me, here, hold on a sec. Um, so I see flares. Um, so, who, so who that was who told me that they were just getting over it? Yeah, Lynn, um, how did it bother your bladder? I'd love to know that. I mean, because we could make an argument that the coughing would have tightened your pelvic floor muscles and messed with your pelvic floor, which could have triggered a muscle flare. But I'd love to know a little bit more about what your symptoms were so that I can pass it along to the top doctors. Maybe we can come up with a strategy for that. And then the second question is, um, we, should, we should do something on coughing. Yeah, I'm building a new section on our website right now. In fact, I should be working on that instead of doing this stream. But you know what? I love streaming um, on COVID. And I will make sure that I get some more information on that and add that. Okay. Lynn, I'm going to write down your name um, because I might want to get back to you here. Yeah, I'd really like to know what you went through. I really would because I want to help other people and you could help a lot of people and kind of preparing them. Uh, Vicky says, do anticholinergics change your brain? I got off one. I was on trazodone for 35 years. The answer is yeah. Yeah, they can, especially if used daily over time. And we have a lot of articles over, over on our website that's talked about that. But anticholinergic, it's a, it's kind of, it's kind of like the Elmeron situation where quantity matters. If you're just taking a little bit every day, then the risk is lower, but there's a, there's a certain number um, uh, milligrams or micrograms that if you're taking that, if you reach that threshold and you're taking that every day, that has been linked to a cognitive, cognitive decline, difficulty thinking, cognition. Sari says, yes, amitriptyline. Yes, guys, amitriptyline is absolutely an anticholinergic that has been linked to cognitive decline. And that is why these medications, uh, I, uh, the AEA is rewriting the guidelines for IC. And I, I, I uh, suggested that um, amitriptyline and Elmeron be, be removed from step two and put in step four because of these now new risk factors. We didn't know this 10 years ago. We know this now. Robin says, one silver lining with COVID, the toilet paper is flying off the shelf so fast it doesn't absorb the perfumes in the store. Wow, girl, you are super sensitive if you could if you could do that. Angie says her spine injections were canceled. Yeah. Yeah, I was hoping to do prolotherapy on my on my uh, ligaments by my SI joint. That's off for probably a year. And we gotta try to, you know, fix this whole hole in my jaw thing. And that's going to be another year. I won't be able to do anything on that for a year. Thankfully, it's a lot better. I had oral surgery a month ago.
Nancy says her appointment was changed to a virtual call. Good. That's awesome. That's the way it should be. All right, guys. Well, listen, it is 545 here. Uh, we've been doing this for about an hour, almost two hours. Um, uh, I wasn't intending for this to be a long meeting. Um, I just wanted to drop in and see how everybody was doing. I may do that again tomorrow, but I do have to go fix dinner for my folks. So I'm going to call last call for questions, last call for questions. Otherwise, what is it? Oh, no, no, no. We have to do this, right? Wait, 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 wait. How do you do the heart symbol? Is that right? That doesn't look right. Is that it? Okay, but my fingers are crooked. I can't do it. Okay. Live long and prosper. How's that instead? All right, guys. Tell you what, I'm going to call it here. I will see you again this weekend, but you may even see me tomorrow. And just uh, just know that sending lots of love and support and hugs your way. We're getting through this together. We rock. Man, listen, this is one thing about the IC community is we rock. We really help each other. We are going to do this. Carry hope in your heart, my friends. Carry hope in your heart. All right, guys. I will see you later. Be good. Making burritos. Mild burritos. With flour tortillas or corn tortillas, ground beef, refried beans, and low fat cheese. No avocado. No tomato. All right, because I don't have them. Okay, see you later. Oops. Oh, well, I'm trying. To, I'm, I'm really trying. Okay. <laughs> All right, YouTube, I'll see you later. Be well.